how are you treating the different uh, B classifications? Yeah, this is, um, these are tricky. Uh, so I think whenever you see a, a Vancouver B periprosthetic fracture, the first thing you got to do is plan to do, uh, plan to revise the hip and plan to fix the femur every time. So make sure you have implants available for both of those things. And so that's the, the number one thing that you can take away from a kind of more clinical, um, excuse me, the more clinical takeaways, just make sure you're prepared to do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what you do in the operating room, I think the first thing you gotta do is how, determine how you're gonna assess if the implant's stable or not. And there's some controversy here in terms of how you do that. Uh, one method is to open up the fracture site and try to assess implant stability of or excuse me, the stability of the implant relative to the uh, proximal femoral fragment. I think that's a little technically difficult to do, whether or not you can really tell if an implant's stable by seeing if the tip of that stem moves relative to the proximal bone fragment, because it's a lot to control trying to torque those two away from each other. I'm a big proponent of opening up the hip capsule and looking, uh, seeing if there's any risk or any, uh, any signs that that implant is loose. So uh, there's controversy in the literature about that. I think uh, there's a lot of techniques you can use, but you've got to be confident in your technique. So find one that works for you and use it. So are you, when you opening up the, the caps, are you actually dislocating them or, um, you know, kind of what, what is your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, that for me at least, and again, I think you'll get different answers from different surgeons on this, but for me, I'll open up the hip capsule and I'll dislocate it. Mm -hmm. And I really want to torque on that stem and give it some good axial and rotational forces. I want to see if that thing will move. Because the outcomes, if you miss it, are really poor. Uh, you've done a lot of work to fix a femur around a loose implant that you didn't realize was loose. And now you might have to take a lot of that fixation out in order to get a revision stem in. So though it is morbid, don't get me wrong, uh, and there's risk of recurrent dislocation if you kind of go back in and out of the hip capsule a bunch of times, finding out now, I think, saves you a lot of uh, angst later. So I'm a, I would say get in there and check it pretty thoroughly. So if you... Because if you get in there, you know, you open up the capsule, you check it, you know, there's not much play, uh, it's rotationally stable. How do you go about um, fixing the fracture? Do you have um, something that you prefer? Do you prefer a lateral plate? Do you use your clodge wires? I know there's a lot of different ways, but are there any techniques and kind of principles in treating these um, stable uh, B1 periprosthetic fractures? Yeah, B1s. Um... I think this is also why I like to go from the top to check that stem stability. So if you got a B1 fracture, I really like to stay away from the fracture site if I can now. I don't want to open it up and de or devascularize around the fracture site. So I, I, my preferred technique in those situations is to try to do a, as a minimally invasive a plate fixation as I can. I prefer a lateral locking plate construct. And I kind of treat these patients like, uh, like you would a hip, a hip fracture patient or presumed to be, have abnormal bone. Um, they uh, had a pretty significant injury and they have a high morbidity mortality. Uh, I don't want this to happen to them again. So I tend to treat the whole bone. I, I use a lateral locking plate and I try to go from distal femur up to the troch and uh, protect the whole bone for the future. So I'll try to put a, a minimally invasive uh, submuscular plate in from distal uh, around the knee. And then in terms of technique and how you fix it, uh, you really want to make sure you get kind of eight cortices distal and anywhere from six to eight cortices proximal, depending on your fixation technique with screws or cable or um, uh, wires up top. Okay. And as far as once you get past the fracture, how many, because this is, this is a pretty long plate. We're going from the greater troke all the way to the distal femur. So once we get past the fracture, how many screws are you putting in? Is it every hole that you're going to put a screw in or is it every other kind of, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's uh, so. It's a good question. Around the stem and distal to the fracture, I think, get treated very differently. You want to make sure you have adequate working length in your plate distally. So you don't want to go fill in every hole distally. That's why I really focus on a couple screws distal in that distal femoral uh, segment, one or two screws maybe centrally. And then once you get around the stem, though, I think fixation can be very difficult depending on what stem is in there. Uh, cemented stems, tend to have a good mantle around them. And the nice thing about cemented stems, you can fire screws into that cement bicortically, which give you a, a lot more fixation than unicortical screws or cables. So I tend to like to try to get bicortical fixation through the cement mantle up top. And up there, you know, I kind of aim the same way. This is more kind of personal preference, but I think of a cable like a single cortex fixation. 
with better rotational control. So unicortical screws and cables in my mind each count as a courtesy when I'm thinking of fixation. And then bicortical screws obviously is two. So I'm shooting if I can to get at least kind of six courtesies, if not eight courtesy equivalents up top around that stem when I'm going for fixation. I try to let that dictate for me how many, how many screws or cables I put around that proximal segment. Uh, otherwise, I, I think it can get a little bit uh, uh, too much on Gestalt and you kind of lose track of what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. And because um, I know I was reading a, reading a paper, I think it was one of Richie's paper, and uh, he quotes and saying that, you know, unicortical lock screws um, aren't really recommended. So um, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, that kind of being like one cortex of uh, fixation. Do you do you tend to use unicortical lock screws in, in your constructs or, or do you kind of just even, it even on the and fracture? also on that? What are what are your thoughts on just doing non locking screws? Do you always do locking? That's a good question, too. So to kind of to answer them both together, I think unicortical locking screws offer some um, additional proximal fixation uh, that is a little bit, I think, more um, uh, reliable than just cable fixation alone. So this is important. You can't just do unicortical locking screws as your proximal fixation alone. I think uh, Ricci's paper is absolutely right. You have really no torsional or rotational control with just unicortical locking screws. So if you're going to use them, they're more of an adjunct to the rest of your fixation. So there's a lot of people I think who are advocating now for a combination of unicortical screws and cerclage cables in order to get a combination of fixed angle construct as well as some torsional control with the use of those cables. Uh, so I'll never use unicortical, unicortical locking screws alone. Uh, it, it simply does it won't work, it'll fail. Um, I try to use them in adjunct with those cables and I, I'll always try to get at least one, if not two screws, if I can, fired around the stem at some point along that proximal fixation in order to increase the, uh, the torsional um, uh, strength of the construct. As far as which screws you use, proximally at the, fra at the stem site, I tend to use uh, locking screws up there because they tend to be unicortical. So I think you get a, a more, uh, greater construct stiffness. Um, if you're in the setting of using unicortical screws with those locking screws, I think there's too high a risk that non-lockers will pull out. Distally, I don't think it's as important. Um, it depends on your fracture pattern, certainly, and uh, inherent fracture stability. Um, but I tend to use non-locking screws distally. Okay, so like a hybrid type of thing. So, um, yep, and I think we probably gave all the, 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 the real heat to Dr. Uh, Decker here, but Cody, just because we're we're at two different institutions, 